Good evening and thank you for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Parikshit Lutra and here are the headlines we are tracking at this hour. The government amends rules for minimum shareholding of listed public sector enterprises, expands the scope to allow them exemption for specified periods. The exemption will remain valid even if the PSU is divested. I get excited about sort of even the unique things that are happening in India using the cloud. And that's, uh, you know, really definitely a real departure from the previous era. Satya Nadella says that he's excited about the cloud adoption in India. Highlights that the unique things happening in India is a departure from the previous era. Says India has the potential to lead in the cloud plus artificial intelligence era. Sohail Samir quits as a CEO of Bharat Pay, transitions to the role of a strategic advisor. CFO Nalan Negi appointed as interim chief while the board searches for a new CEO. Sources say Samir had indicated an intent to quit as CEO months ago and the decision was mutually agreed upon with the board. The parent company of ShareChat and short video app uh, Moj reports a loss of 3,000 crore rupees in FY22. Its losses have doubled from the previous financial year, revenue has also increased from 80 crore rupees to nearly 350 crore rupees. CBI expands the ambit of its investigation in the ICICI Bank Videocon loan case, seeks details of 10 other high-value loans disbursed by ICICI Bank to Videocon between 2012 and 2018. CBI sources tell CNBC TV18 that Venugopal Dut said he was arm twisted to transfer 64 crore rupees to New Power Renewables when his statement was recorded in absence of the coachers. Adani Enterprises will be paying an additional 48 rupees per share to those who sold their shares in the NETV open offer. This to match the price that was paid to NETV founder, promoter Pranoy Roy and Radhika Roy, who sold most of their stake to the conglomerate last week. Thousands of employees of three state-owned power distribution companies in Maharashtra plan a three-day strike starting midnight tonight. They are protesting against a parallel license sought by Adani Electricity to distribute power in areas it currently does not operate in. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh inaugurates crucial infrastructure projects in Arunachal Pradesh. This was his first visit to the state post the Tawang face-off between Indian Army and Chinese troops last month. Singh said India has every capability to thwart challenges along the border. Five-judge constitution bench holds that no additional restrictions can be imposed on free speech of ministers and lawmakers, adds that their comments cannot be attributed to the government of the day. Justice Nagaratna, however, says that indiscreet speech is a cause of concern, urges political parties to control their ministers by developing a code of conduct. Let's start with the day's market action. Sensex gained over 120 points and the Nifty moved back above 18,200 as stock markets ended the second trading session of 2023 in the green. A late rally in bank stocks aided the recovery of Dalal Street. Mid-cap index also managed to keep their heads above the water. From stocks to gold now, prices of the yellow metal have been soaring in India. It has hit the highest levels in two years. Globally, the price of gold has been moving higher ahead of the U.S. Federal Reserve's latest policy meeting. With predictions of a global recession in 2023, many analysts are expecting gold prices to hit record highs this year. Focusing on an important story aimed at uh, IDBI, apparently, in a bid to smoothen its strategic divestment process, the government has changed the definition of a government company with respect to the minimum 51% shareholding. Not just that, the government has also eased the 25% minimum public shareholding norm for any listed center, state or PSU-owned company. Now, this was a rule that was applicable since 2021. It has been expanded now. Sapna Das joins us to explain what these key changes are. Sapna, tell us sir, what will be the benefit to IBI and India's divestment roadmap. I think the government has changed the rules in terms of uh, a lot of CPSCs and PSDs meeting that 25% minimum public shareholding norm, uh, keeping two things in mind. Number one, uh, an overall uh, exemption or rather an extension of exemption is required 
uh, you know, for some CPSCs and PSBs at least, where the public float is very uh, low at the moment. That's one. Second, of course, in terms of meeting the strategic disinvestment goal, here again, you know, those companies uh, which are to be privatized and where the public float is quite low at the moment, I think also trying to give them some kind of a comfort or rather a message to the potential suitors. For example, IDBI Bank uh, could be a fit case. Uh, public float is somewhere around 66 odd percent. Uh, even after change in management, uh, you know, the, the bank is under a strategic disinvestment process at the moment. So even once it's privatized and change of management, takes place, it will be difficult for the promoter, new promoter to just, just step up uh, the MPS from the current 6% to 25%. Hence, the dispensation for exemption will also apply to those companies uh, which are being privatized. And uh, the government will specifically notify the deadline for that extension of exemption. Uh, we are given to understand that probably they are mulling on a two-year extension. Uh, so, you know, that will come through at some point in time and uh, this is the overall aim. The overall aim is to give comfort to those CPSCs and PSBs which have yet to meet the MPS norms of 25 watt percent and also to facilitate strategic disinvestment. This is removal of another regulatory hurdle as far as the strategic stake sales are concerned. The government has also additionally uh, made uh, a provision in the notification that if you um, grant such an exemption, for uh, a specified period, then uh, that exemption will carry even if the entity is privatized. So clearly this is aimed at um, uh, the IDBI bank. With the voting of public so low, the 75%, even if it is 75%, there is a power with available in most of the companies for with the promoters to pass this. So that objective has failed. That is one. Second part is the, the liquidity part. Liquidity is not a function of percentage. It is a function of number of shares that are with the public. And even if the large number of shares are with the public, institutions like LIC or banks or some FII, they keep on holding and sticking to their investment for 25 years or something like this. Because LIC, if they are holding a share, they do not sell on a daily basis. Right. Uh, remember, the EOI for IDBI is likely to be issued by uh, the Finance Ministry this month, and the government is hoping to complete the strategic divestment process in IDBI by the end of this fiscal. Moving on to an uh, important story now, Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella says that he's excited about the cloud adoption in India, highlights are the unique things happening in the country is a departure from the past, says India has the potential to lead in the cloud plus artificial intelligence segments. Um, and, and we see tremendous momentum today uh, when it comes uh, to cloud adoption. In fact, when I think about Microsoft, that's when, the big, like, when in the client server era, we sold a few servers in India. But in the cloud era, it's a completely different ballgame, right? When I look at every business and the cloud consumption, uh, it's tremendous to see. We see Adani choosing uh, Azure for its uh, expansion, HFDC. Uh, using it, in fact, to consolidate all of the data platforms. Um, and, you know, Yes Bank built their super app. So tremendous uh, adoption of cloud. Uh, and in fact, you know, the more and more I, I talk to you know, my partners and customers here, I get excited about sort of even the unique things that are happening in India using the cloud. And that's, uh, you know, really definitely a real departure from the previous era. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's move on and focus on uh, Bharat Pay, which had made headlines uh, in, uh, in 2022. Sohail Samir has quit as the CEO of the company. The company said that Samir will step down as CEO and will assume the role of a strategic advisor from the 7th of January. CFO Nalin Negi has been appointed as interim chief while the board searches for a new CEO. Ritu Singh joins us now with the latest. Ritu, uh, what's the company's succession plan now? Well, the spate of exits at Bharat Pay continue with the company now announcing that its current CEO, Suheil Samir, will be stepping down from his position as the CEO effective the 7th of January and transition into his new role as a strategic advisor for the company. And in the meantime, the CFO, which is Nalin Negi, is going to be acting as the interim CEO while the board looks 
for the next chief executive officer of Bharat Pay. Now, we've been given to understand that this decision to move on uh, from a CEO position was mutually agreed upon between Sohail Samir and the board of the company. We understand that Sohail had expressed his uh, intent to move on from Bharat Pay to the board several months ago, and the board also wanted to expedite the search for the next CEO because they knew of uh, this decision in order to stabilize the ship ahead of the IPO, which is planned for two years later, and therefore the decision was mutually agreed upon. But that said, Sohail Samir was hired by Ashni Rovan, so this will be sort of a clean slate, uh, slate for both the board uh, and for Sohail Samir also to start over in his full-time capacity as an angel investor. Remember, he's already made a few key investments and he wants to take that up as a full-time job. Rajneesh Kumar, the chairman of Bharat Pain statement, acknowledged uh, Sohail Samir's role and he also said that they recognize the need to dedicate time and resources into finding the next CEO and Sohail Samir also confirming that he will look forward to the next phase of his journey which is going to be as a full-time investor. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ritu Singh, for joining us. Now, the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion is working on a new industrial policy which will be sent to the Cabinet for approval. The proposals include more funding for industries through a development finance institution. Latest in the government's electric vehicle push. Commerce and Industries Minister Piyush Goyal held a meeting with major players from the auto industry to discuss standards of battery swapping. Sources say more consultations would be needed before a final decision can be taken on battery swapping standards. The latest in the ICICI Bank Videocon loan case, Chanda Kocher, her husband Deepa Kocher and Videocon group promoter Venugopal Dut continue to remain in judicial custody. The CBI has also expanded the ambit of its investigation. So far, it was only looking at loans disbursed by ICICI to Videocon between 2009 and 2001, uh, 2011. But now, sources say, the agency is investigating 10 more high-value loans that were disbursed to Videocon group by ICICI between 2012 and 2018. Sandhya Gora gets us the details of this crucial development. Sources have told CNBC TV18 that in ICICI Videocon loan fraud case, CBI has increased the ambit of its investigation. Till now, CBI was investigating six high-value loans which were given by ICICI Bank to Videocon group of companies between 2009 and 2011. But now, CBI is also investigating 10 more high-value loans which were, which were dispersed by ICICI Bank to Videocon group of companies between 2012 till 2018. Sources have told CNBC TV18 that CBI has also written to ICICI Bank and has sought detail, details of all these 10 high-value loans. Apart from that, talking about investi the investigation in the case, Venu Gopal Dhut, who is, a, uh, who is one of the accused in the case and the main beneficiary according to CBI, so when he was confronted with the coaches at that time, he said the 64 crore rupee uh, amount which was transferred by his company to Deepak Coacher's new power one day after receiving a loan of 300 crore rupee, that uh, was a genuine business investment. But when CBI recorded his statement, uh, when he was questioned alone at that time, Venu Gopal Dhut claimed, and this is what the sources have told us, that to his statement to CBI, Venu, uh, Venu Gopal Dhut claimed that the reason he transferred those 64 crore rupees to Deepak Kocher's firm was because he was arm twisted. Uh, talking about the investigation, uh, uh, CBI as of now is investigating the case and is likely to file a chart sheet soon. All the three accused are in judicial custody till 10th of January. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Santya Gora, for joining us uh, with that important story. Let's take a look at the key stories now from the startup space. Uh, Arundhati Ramnan joins us with a wrap. Arundhati, please tell us what's been happening in the startup industry. There's been a lot of action from the startup world. So let's begin. ShareChat and short video app Moj's parent company saw its losses balloon to 2,988 crore rupees in FY22, doubling from 1,460 crore rupees reported in the previous fiscal year. According to regulatory filings, revenue from operations increased many folds to nearly 347 crore rupees, up from 80 crore rupees in FY21, growing over 331%. Now, Tata Digital's president, Mukesh Bansal, stepped away from the day-to-day -day operations of Tata New. As per a report, Bansal will no longer be involved in Tata New's key businesses, but he might continue to be in an advisory role. Remember, Mukesh Bansal joined Tata Digital after the company invested $75 million in Bansal's cure fit. Now, fintech player Zagal files IPO papers with SEBI. The IPO comprises a fresh uh, issue of equity shares worth 490 crore rupees and an offer for sale component of 1.05 crore stocks. 
Rural household focus lender Sarvagram Solutions closes its Series C funding round at $35 million, led by venture capital fund Eleva Equity. Other investors that participated in the round were Elevation Capital, Temasek, and TVS Capital Funds. Meanwhile, Elon Musk SpaceX will raise $750 million in a new round of funding that will value the company at $137 billion, say reports, and recent Horowitz will likely lead this new funding round. Early investors in SpaceX include Founders Fund, Sequoia Giga Fund, and many others. Electric car maker Tesla delivered a record 1.3 million vehicles last year, which was 40% more than what it did in 2021. This came after the company delivered over 405,000 vehicles in the last three months of 2022. However, this was lower than estimates on slowing demand, rising interest rates and worry of a recession. Vehicle deliveries in the fourth quarter were lesser than what Tesla produced and this shortfall is unusual for the company. With that, it is back to you. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Arundhati, for joining us with that important update. We're going to take a short break here on, uh, on, on CNBC TV 18, but when we return, we will get you an important story from the Supreme Court, and this is a five-judge constitution bench holding that no additional restrictions can be imposed on free speech of ministers and lawmakers. More details when we're back. It's a good CEO from a great CEO. CNBC TV 18, in partnership with McKinsey, has arrived at a definitive list of India's top CEOs. And the first CEO to make our short list is... TV Narendran took over as the MD of Tata Steel in 2013 when the company was in danger of a collapse. Today, Tata Steel is the most profitable company in the Tata Group. A company which only talks of its past has no future. And uh, I think uh, Tata Steel, uh, sometimes uh, we used to talk a bit more of the past than we needed to, uh, or rather we were proud of our past, but were we talking enough about the future? Were we thinking enough about the future? Were we, uh, you know, kind of indulging ourselves more than required in the past? I mean, the past was something done wonderfully well by many of our predecessors. The winning mindset. Welcome back. You're watching India Business Hour with me, Parikshit Lutra. Let's get you more national stories now. Thousands of employees of three state-owned power distribution companies in Maharashtra have planned a three-day strike starting midnight tonight. These employees are protesting against Adani Electricity, seeking license to operate in more areas where it does not have distribution network. Reports suggest that the Maharashtra Electricity Regulatory Commission is likely to grant permission to Adani Electricity for power distribution in areas like Thane, Navi Mumbai, Panvel, uh, Taloja and Uran. The agitating employees are demanding that no private company should be given the license to distribute power in areas where they do not have a network of their own and where state power distribution companies are successfully operating. Employees allege private operators want to make profits by using the existing distribution infrastructure which will dent the financial health of state-owned distribution companies. The Supreme Court has ruled out imposing additional restrictions on right to free speech by ministers, MPs, MLAs. A five-judge constitution bench has ruled that restrictions on free speech are the same for all citizens and cannot go beyond what is prescribed in the constitution. Ashmit Kumar joins us. Ashmish, take us through what happened in the Supreme Court. Well, the question that was laid before the Apex Court is that what happens in a situation where an MP or an MLA is found to be making hate speech or issuing incendiary comments? Well, that was the question. Does it need any further safeguards or restrictions? The answer is no. That's the answer that the Apex Court has given. A five-judge constitution bench of the Apex Court has said that there are no further restrictions required as far as free speech of MPs and MLAs are concerned. Not just that, the Supreme Court has also further protected elected leaders and public functionaries by saying that comments by such leaders cannot in fact be attributed to the government of the day. Not just that, the Supreme Court goes a step further uh, and says that uh, mere speeches uh, being made by such public functionaries cannot in fact be said to be violative of constitutional rights of the armed army of the common man. Those are three key takeaways from the majority view. However, also important to keep in mind that Justice B.V. Nagaratna, who was also a member of this five-judge bench, issued an independent judgment, like in the demonetization case. And while she's not at odds with these assertions that have been made by the majority view, she has given an interesting 
interesting rationale why she arrives at those conclusions. And it's important to dive into what some of those suggestions were being made by Justice B.V. Nagaratna. The first is she says that hate speech continues to be a major concern. It strikes at the heart of the multicultural society that we seek to have here in India based on principles of equality, fraternity and harmony. That's one. The second key takeaway here, uh, she says, as a part of her judgment, is that uh, public functionaries and senior leaders, given the influence that they share over last, large masses of uh, uh, population, it's important that they are measured and they're restrained in their comments and in their words. The third key takeaway, and this is the part where she's slightly at odds with the majority view, uh, is that she says clearly in her order that disparaging comments being made uh, by senior government functionaries and government leaders can, in fact, be vicariously attributed to the government of the day. And the fourth key takeaway here is where she says very clearly uh, that while there are no guidelines or restrictions being imposed as far as free speech of MPs, MLAs is concerned, that issue is still open for the parliament to consider and decide on, number one. And number two, it is for the political party, she suggests as a part of her judgment, it's for these parties to rein in such errant leaders by establishing a code of conduct. So strong suggestions of those coming in uh, from the Supreme Court as well as by Justice B.V. Nagaratna. All right, thank you very much, uh, Ashmit Kumar, for joining us with that important ruling from the Supreme Court. Now, the Bombay High Court has pulled up the Maharashtra government in the Johnson & Johnson baby powder case. The court has questioned the state government's delay of over two years in taking action against the company for using an outdated testing method for its baby power product. According to live law, the court has directed the state FDA to respond by Friday on whether it wants to consider retesting of the samples. Remember, the Maharashtra FDA had cancelled the license of the company's baby powder in September 22. Ethylene glycol has been named as a cause of death in multiple cases across countries over the years. Recently, it has been named as the contaminant in the cough syrup manufactured by Marion Biotech that allegedly resulted in the death of 18 children in Uzbekistan. So why are companies still using this component? And what are the regulations behind it? Ekta Batra gets us a deep dive. Thanks for that. Well, yes, ethylene glycol and diethylene glycol are colorless, odorless, sweetish tasting substances which are more used for industrial purposes, ranging from antifreeze formulation to brake fluids to paints, plastics, etc. The pharmaceutical grade can be used for medicines and consumer products in the quantity that is recommended. Remember, the two substances can be toxic if there is any contamination to the pharma grade and if it is consumed beyond recommended levels. In fact, there are safer alternatives to these substances such as glycerin and propylene glycol for drugs. So why is ethylene glycol or DEG then still being used when safer substitutes are available? Factors range from the substance being easily available, has greater solubility, more palatable, i.e. sweeter, hence used for pediatric drugs, and lastly, more cost efficient. The question then arises, which companies use these substances? Do all pharma companies use them? Feedback is that there is no regulation that indicates it should not be used. But based on history, ethylene glycol and DEG should be avoided. Generally, companies with good R&D and manufacturing practices avoid using the component in case it can be substituted. So if pharma companies do use ethylene glycol and DEG, are they required to test these solvents? Yes, Schedule M of the Drugs and Cosmetics Act indicates all raw material needs to be tested for compliance with required standards of quality. Feedback again is many a time smaller companies who cannot afford to test solvents or those with lax manufacturing processes or poor, or poor personnel might not comply with the law. In some instances, allegedly, the quality certificate provided by the distributor is used by pharma companies to get approvals. Lastly, what can be done to tackle the problem? Experts say there needs to be tighter regulations and guidelines in place, such as in the Indian Pharmacopoeia. Frequent inspections by regulators and checks and balances to ensure a quality supply chain. And more importantly, these steps need to be enforced. One can also consider factors such as putting out a list of more hazardous substances, such as glycols, on the drugs manufactured. Currently, only the active ingredients need to be listed, which can possibly lead to more informed decisions 
and probably more accountability. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ekta Batra, for joining us with that very important uh, report. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of India Business Hour. Thank you for watching. News continues right here on CNBC TV 18.